I'm Mark Payne of the West Virginia Humanities Council. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the Humanities Council that brings historical figures to life through portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. These presentations are both entertaining and educational. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to nonprofit organizations across West Virginia, such as schools, libraries, historical societies, and a wide range of community groups. History Live is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. We encourage your organization or school to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Harriet Tubman or Stonewall Jackson come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures. Nothing compares to the live in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts, a monologue, a question answer session with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. Our History Lab presenters have researched a variety of sources such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History Lab presentation is not a play. It is an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Live presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we will change the format a bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give a sample of how a History Live presentation can add to the offerings at your school or organization. There will be information on the screen at the end of this program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Live character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guest from history. We are pleased to have with us in the studio, Mark Twain. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to introduce to you a man whose great learning and veneration for truth are only exceeded by his high moral character and majestic presence. I refer in these very general terms to myself I consider introductions to be unnecessary, but if it is the custom, I prefer to do the act myself, so I can rely upon getting in all the facts. I was born modest, but it wore off. I was once introduced to an audience by a lawyer who kept both hands in his pockets. He said, uh, he said, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to introduce to you Mr. Mark Twain, a humorist, a very funny fellow, a rare creature indeed. Why, I was struck speechless by this complimentary thunderbolt. Scarcely in my lifetime had I had ever heard a compliment so beautifully phrased or so well deserved. But we had a rare creature in our midst that evening. We had a lawyer who kept his hands in his own pockets. Oh my, we all like compliments. We all do. Humorous, burglars, politicians, all of us in the trade. The plan of the newspapers, good. If you can't get a compliment any other way, pay yourself one. I do that quite often. In fact, I'm going to do it right now. I can tell you that there are two truly remarkable men in this world. Kipling is one, and I'm the other. Between us, we possess all knowledge. Kipling knows all that there is to be known, and I know the rest. A compliment came to me indirectly the other day from a little Montana girl. She was standing in a large hall with a portrait of me on the wall. And after gazing at it steadily for a while, she turned and she exclaimed, 
Why, we've got a picture of John the Baptist, too. Only ours has got more trimmings. I suppose by that she meant the halo. I don't believe anybody's ever suggested that a portrait of me should contain a halo. No. That would seem out of character, wouldn't it? You know, it pains me to hear my name mentioned with those great authors. Well, they have a sad habit of dying off. Chaucer is dead. Milton is gone. Shakespeare is no longer with us. And I'm not feeling too well myself. My doctor tells me I'm on the verge of being an old man. I don't put too much stock in it, though. I've been on the verge of being an angel my whole life. That hasn't happened yet. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about my boyhood. When I was back there helping to inhabit that small town on the Mississippi River, Hannibal, Missouri, oh, it was a wonderful life. No crime. Just little things like pillaging orchards or watermelon patches. Breaking the Sabbath. Oh, we did not break the Sabbath often enough to signify. Only once a week, perhaps. And as a general rule, I was a shy, backward, unadventurous boy. I did jump off a two-story stable one time. On another occasion, I gave a plug of tobacco to a mule and retired without waiting for an answer. I remember out in our front yard, there was a white fence. You may have read about that fence at Tom Sawyer. But just beyond the fence ran a dusty, dirty country road. And if you would follow that road some 40-odd miles to the southwest, you would come to the almost invisible town of Florida, Missouri. Well, I was born. Well, I raised Florida's population to 100. I increased it by a full 1%. Other great men of history cannot make that distinction. Shakespeare couldn't do it for London. It may be immodest of me to say, but uh, I suppose I could have done it for Paris. But I chose to do it for Florida. I remember the day I was born. I hadn't any teeth. And my mother was glad. Well, now, just shy of Florida was my Aunt Patsy and Uncle John Qualls farm. And I spent the majority of my summers there on that farm. And out there on that dusty road that I was telling you about was a good place to find snakes, a son of themselves. Well, when there were house snakes or garter snakes, we would take them up and put them in Aunt Patsy's work basket for a surprise. Now, my Aunt Patsy had a powerful prejudice against snakes. And when she would sit down in her chair and bring that work basket into her lap to do some darning or knitting. And those snakes commenced to crawl out. Why, it disordered her mind. Well, those weren't the only snakes on that farm. I remember this particular summer, I was helping my Uncle John to make hay. Now, I want you to understand that my Uncle John was what you would call one of those there uh, progressive farmers. And on this particular summer, he had just purchased a two mule, five foot sickle bar McCormick mower. Why, it would lay down a whole field of hay faster than the labor could even think about doing it with size. 
In addition to that machine, he bought a single mule buck rake. Now that instrument got its name because when the operator tripped the lever to dump those long sweeping tines that scared it across the ground that threw up the hay, if he wasn't holding on to his seat, why those tines would come up and try to buck him off like a green broke coat. Well, I must admit <coughs> that on this particular day, I was doing a great deal of the hay shocking with my half pint hay fork when my Uncle John came up to me and said, Samuel, <coughs> well, now this took me off guard. My uncle usually referred to me as Sammy. And I had learned in school that if you were spoken to by your formal name, it was a good idea to look around and make sure that there was no switches handy. Well, on this particular day, Uncle John said, Samuel, now I want you to stay away from that last row of hay over there. I believe I've scooped up a timber rattler in that row. You let it be and you let the adults shock that row of hay. Well, now I was always mindful of my Uncle John. But you see, on this occasion, he had overlooked a major detail. He had not appointed a guard for that old boy. So I appointed myself as his jailer. <clears throat> well, directly Uncle Daniel and the rest of his colored comrades came along, and when they commenced to move that hay, that old boy began to sing. Now, Uncle Daniel was poised with his pitchfork like a trident. And when that last flake of hay was removed, there he was. Why, well, it was the largest snake I'd ever seen. It was as big around as a man's thigh and three times as long. And he made a lunge for Uncle Daniel, but Uncle Daniel thrust his pitchfork down and impaled him. And that old boy couldn't reach Uncle Daniel. But he was so angry, he commenced to strike the handle of that pitchfork. But now one of Uncle Daniel's comrades allowed that if we just took time of the day to notice, it was pretty nigh lunch. And that if we just go on up on the knoll and sit under the shade tree and eat our lunch, most likely as not, when we would come back, that old boy would be dead. <clears throat> and he was. But the handle of that pitchfork had swollen up to the size of a good oak tree. While well, we had to go to the barn and fetch the two-man cross-cut saw and timber it. We cut it into three sections, hitched up the mule and took it down to the local sawmill. Well, the miller promptly sawed it up into boards. And not long after that came a man who was in search of some lumber <clears throat> to build an addition to his cabin, seeing as how his family had outgrown it. Well, now, being a prudent man, this fellow treated those boards with turpentines on both sides to keep out the weather and the termites. Well, now, everybody knows that turpentine is a home remedy for snake bite. Well, if you get bit on the hand, you do a little X across the the, the wounds and you slosh a bunch of turbot time in the rag and you wipe it around there to draw out the poison. And that's just what it did. And those boards returned to their original size. Why, the poor man had been away on business and he came back and found the addition to his home collapsed and it had killed his whole family. Well, Let's see what else I can lie, tell you about. We moved away from Florida when I was about four years old <clears throat> and came to Hannibal. Just outside my bedroom window ran the lightning rod. And oh, it was convenient for getting in and out of your room when you had matters and duties to perform that were requiring privacy. I remember one day when I had skipped school 
I decided to use my private entrance to come back into my bedroom after my mother and father who was fast asleep. And in the interim, I had decided to hide out in my father's law office, seeing how he was the justice of the peace at this time. And while prowling around in his office, I discovered a dead body. I went away from there. I didn't go away in any sort of hurry. I just went away through the window. I took the sash with me. I didn't need the sash, but it seemed just as easy to take it along as it was to leave it behind. I remember my first day of school. I was about seven. And upon entering the schoolyard, there stood a strapping 15-year-old girl in the customary calico dress and sunbonnet. And she exclaimed to the whole world upon my entering, Here stands a seven-year-old boy that does not know yet how to chaw tobacco. From the look on everyone's face, I realized that I was a degraded object. And I intended upon effecting a reform. All I succeeded in doing was making myself sick. I did learn to smoke tolerably well, but that did not conciliate anyone. Children often overlook the defects in other children's character. Well, there was a rule that if you were caught writing on any desk in any manner whatsoever, you would be fined three dollars or given the choice of public chastisement. That meant a whipping, not at school, but in the public square, the town square, on a Saturday. Having violated this rule on one occasion, I was given the choice. So I went home and told my father. He allowed that it would not be good for my reputation or his as justice of the peace to have me publicly whipped in the town square that Saturday. So he gave me the three dollars. I want to tell you that three dollars at that time in my existence was a powerful sum of money. And a whipping was of little consequence. That's how I earned my first three dollars. Oh, it used to take all summer to grow back the hide that they scun off of me during the school term. Well, Tell you about my school teacher, Miss Hav. She was a stern old New England warrior. Had eyes like pivot guns. Why, she could roll one forward and one to the rear, just like a senator. I never seemed to think that I could like Miss Hav, unless it was on a raft at sea no other provisions in sight. Well, one day I broke a rule. No one asked me which rule it was. I broke so many. But on this particular occasion, she told me if I broke that rule again, I was likely to get a whipping. Well, sure enough, I broke that rule again. And she said, Samuel Langhorn Clemens, get up here. Well, I was shocked. I was stunned. Scarcely in my lifetime had I had ever heard all three of my formal names put together in such a procession. After I recovered, I reported to her desk. And she said, uh, Samuel, I want you to go out back to the switch pile and bring me a switch. Well, now, I thought I was a fairly good judge of switches. So... When I got out to the pile, I dug down to the very center, deepest part, where no sun or light could have shined upon those, and I picked one that was fairly nigh rotten. 
I brought it back in and I presented it to Miss Hobbs. She took one look at the switch and one look at me with equal amounts of disapprobation. And she said, Samuel, I can see that you're no judge of switches. I should have to appoint another boy to find a proper one. Why, it grieves me to this day to think of all the eager faces that lit up in anticipation of choosing the item for my destruction. Jim Dunlap got the job. And when he returned, I can say that I can say that he was an expert in switch selection. Doesn't it just grieve you to death? Isn't it that life's one of major annoyments when there's always somebody on hand to set a good example? Well, it's a terrible death to be talked to death. So I pause every now and again to give you an opportunity to escape. And this will be your first chance. I'm here with our guest today, uh, Mr. Mark Twain, uh, uh, or Samuel Clemens, and uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here with us today, sir. My pleasure, sir. I want to uh, start by asking you, uh, how did you, your, your real name is uh, Samuel Clemens, how did you manage to come up with the pen name of Mark Twain? Well, there's two published stories about that, and I'll let you determine which one's the true one. When I was serving as editor of the, the Virginia Territorial Express out in Virginia City, I had a habit of going over to the local saloon after work and holding up two fingers, and the bar maid would yell out, Mark Twain, meaning I wanted two scotches. Now, other published report is that from my experience of being a riverboat pilot and being on the river, Mark Twain was a significant <clears throat> the signal for safe water. The leadsman would throw out his lead rope and when it came down to a large knot on that, it was Mark Twain and they'd sing that out because it stood for 12 feet of water and that meant it was safe passage for the packet boats on the river. Hmm. Um, Mr. Twain, most people know you uh, as an author, although you've certainly led a very full life and have witnessed a lot of uh, historic events uh, in your day, but I'm I have to ask you, which of your, uh, which of your many books uh, that you've written, written, which of those do you consider to be your best or your, or your most important books? Well, based on sales, I would say Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn is probably what I'm most noted for. But of course, on that list, I'd have to list Innocents Abroad, my first book, seeing as how that's what got me open to the public. I very much enjoyed my second book, Roughing It, on, on my experiences out west. Uh, uh, if you want to know what my most important book was, I'd have to say Joan of Arc. I published it under a pseudonym because it, it was a, s a serious work of history and all my previous works had had considerable humor mm -hmm. and I wanted it to take, take uh, uh, some, some serious look at it. Of course, there was a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, Puddin' Head Wilson, Pride uh, or, or the Prince and the Papa. Uh, those were all some major works. But I was mostly known for writing short stories, such as Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, The Blue Jay Yawn, and other such works. Hmm. Well, at this time, I would like to introduce you to uh, the uh, scholar. Uh, this is not really Mark Twain, although it seems like it is. Uh, this is actually uh, Mr. Doug Riley uh, from Tunnelton, up in Preston County. Doug, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, Doug's one of our History Lab uh, presenters. Also does portrays for us uh, General Stonewall Jackson. That's correct. As well. So, uh, uh, Doug, I want to uh, ask you, uh, what sort of what sources did you go to when you were developing your character here for Mark Twain? What did you what sources did you find? Well, there are from? a wealth of sources on Mark Twain. I mean, he wrote uh, from the '60s through to his death in 1910. So, there's just a wealth of knowledge out there. For the beginner that wants to learn more about Mark Twain, I would recommend Ron Powers' biography. I think it was published in about 2007. It was called Mark Twain, A Life. Now that's a general overview of his whole life and I think Ron did a good job with that. Mm -hmm. And then from there, internet research and you can dig, 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 and dig. You'll never be able to read everything about Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is your favorite 
Twain book or books? In, in, in well, uh, you know, it's hard to pick a favorite. Right. Um, having been a history teacher, though, uh, the Gilded Age was one of the ones that, that, that uh, surprised me in one way, is teaching uh, history. You know, I always taught about the, the era of the Gilded Age in American history. Come to find out, it was Twain's book that coined that phrase for our American history. And it was, a, it was an insight, even though it was a fictional tale, about the, what was going on with the people, the common people, being wound up in this movement in mm -hmm. our American history. Mm -hmm. I know we were talking just a second ago about the range of things that, uh, that Clemens did in his lifetime. I think maybe some people aren't that familiar, maybe. I mean, they're familiar with his, his character of Mark Twain, which is pretty much your persona. Uh, would you mind to just kind of relate a few of the things that he did? Well, you know, he, he existed just in that antebellum area before the Civil War, so he could speak very well of what the social conditions was there. Uh, during the Civil War, he gives us a different perspective in that he spent the Civil War years out west and uh, was involved in all the, the gold mine and silver mine fever that was going on. He was the first American reporter to go to the Sandwich Islands, which we know as Hawaii. Uh, he came back and became a traveling reporter on the very first cruise ship to ever uh, go from America over to Europe and the Middle East uh, with a group of Christians um, on their first tour of relics of, uh, of the uh, Christian era. Uh, and uh, he, from that material, he wrote his first book, Innocence Abroad. So um, he was also involved in the Industrial Revolution as uh, an investor uh, and, and tried to be an inventor. Uh, he knew Edison, uh, he knew uh, Tesla. Uh, he got involved with uh, Standard Oil's uh, vice president, uh, Henry Ruddleson uh, Rogers, uh, who helped him financially. So I'm saying he was tied and connected into the world leaders and almost every facet of American life. Yeah, what, wasn't he involved, didn't he kind of help uh, Ulysses Grant get his? Well, yes, uh, he had met honor. Ulysses Grant while he was president, and uh, once Ulysses Grant had contracted throat cancer and was very near his death, he encouraged him very much to publish his memoirs to provide money for his family. And in, in, and in fact, his publishing company, Mark Twain's publishing company, was one of the few profitable books that Mark Twain had published through Webster and Company, which Mark Twain owned. Mm -hmm. uh, I know in your research you had mentioned, uh, well, there is a, a sort of a West Virginia connection uh, with Mark Twain. Would you tell us a little bit? Yes, uh, during my research, you know, I come to find out that the first person I ran across was Sir Rod Clemens, which was his first cousin, uh, which he would offhand mention from time to time. I believe he mentioned him when he did a, uh, a lecture in Wheeling. But Sherrard was uh, a lawyer in William, a judge, and was elected to be the representative to the statehood convention on secession. Of course, uh, being from the Wheeling area, he voted against it twice and came back and was instrumental in our statehood movement. Further research found that uh, Samuel B. Clemens, his progenitor, his grandfather, actually lived in Mason County and is where he started the family. Uh, Unfortunately, Samuel B. Clemens was killed when he was age 35 at a house raising when a log uh, ran away and killed him. And that was in Mason County? That was in Mason County, Virginia at the time, right. but now the same Mason County that we claim is West Virginia. Hmm. Okay. Well, Doug, again, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule uh, uh, and being here with us today. Thanks for doing a great job, as always. And uh, uh, I want to thank all of you out there for tuning in again into History Alive.